Okay. As you know, I write a lot about JavaScript. So I've been working on this book called Node in Practice. It's being published by Manning. And this talk comes from researching this book. So I wanted to talk confidently about uh, what Node does internally. Um, it, it doesn't go into, does anybody like C++? That guy, that, not many people. Well, this is, this is the thing. We work with JavaScript, but it can be useful to know what's going on. So I've tried to pitch this at JavaScript developers that just want to get a feel. Like, you want to know the difference between non-blocking, asynchronous, and thread pools. Like, if you can answer that, then I've helped. So, <clears throat> I, have some, I have some prizes here. And these prizes are books. <laughs> but they're book coupons. So, I've put some British-themed computer science questions that aren't about Alan Turing or Ada Lovelace in this talk. And my slides don't have any funny pictures because we've only got 25 minutes. Um, although I've left this one in there, which is a GIF with a J. <laughs> I say it that way because it sounds funny. Um, and that's a Ruby on Rails developer. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, what Node looks like in my lazy block diagram. And what we're going to talk about today is the bit in the red dotted line. So the core modules, C++ bindings, and some other bits and bobs, mainly uh, UV. So you can understand all of this, but maybe not V8 so much, because that's some crazy here be dragons nonsense. But um, you can understand the core modules, certainly. So if you've never looked at them, Hopefully this talk will inspire you to, to open Node Source and have a look around. So today we'll look at Node Source layout, how to navigate it, what's in it, and then we're going to look at the core modules, then C++ bindings, then we're going to go all the way from JavaScript to libuv, and maybe tickle the operating system a little bit. And then I'll, show you, I'll just quickly show you how to make a debug build in case you've never seen that, so you can prod node yourself and see what it does. So what's the point? Why are we here? Not metaphysically, but why are we here <laughs> to learn about node? Well, hopefully, if you learn a little bit about what, what goes on internally, you can use the core modules more effectively. And you could do a little bit of low-level debugging, like if you've now been scared to death about memory leaks, maybe you could have a look at how that works. Uh, you could even write C++ add-ons, which doesn't mean you have to be some kind of wizard. It just means that you have to, that you can write bindings to existing C++ libraries. That, that's what most NPM modules really are. They're, they're not, there's not a huge amount of new native code in there. And then I want you to be able to say what is, what uses thread pools, what's non-blocking, and what asynchronous APIs are. And although things like DR, DRY encapsulation and best practices like that are good, ultimately you should avoid repeating node. This is a so source of frustration for me when I'm working on my pristine node project and new developers from the Ruby or Python world come in. They just install all these modules and half the time a lot of it can be done already. Not, it's not just that it can be done, it can be done well if they only took the time to learn what's there. All right, so here's the first book question. You've got to answer it quickly because we don't have much time. <laughs> who was the... Sinclair. All right, the, who, who was that? All right. There you go. There's another question. <laughs> this is probably the reason I started programming because of this computer, so I thought that was important. Anyway. <laughs> uh, all you need to do to get node source code is check it out with git. So if you're comfortable with git branches and tags, which I assume you are, then if you've got node source code on your laptop, you can switch between different releases because they tag releases. So when I'm working on my book and I want to say node 0.10.x does this, even if I'm disconnected, if I'm on my long commute and I'm, I'm just trying to get some work on my book done, I can switch between nodes releases. And 
I can get in there and have a look at what it's doing. I don't need any special tools, just Git. And once you've got the source code, Node's, I think Node's code is actually, there's not much cruft in there, like if any, like it, it's fairly clean. And the three most important directories are probably depths, lib, and source. The, the depths directory has the third party dependencies, so you'll find UV and V8 in there. Then you've got the core modules, which are JavaScript. So that's probably where most of us want to hang out for a bit. And then the source folder has the C++ bindings. So that's things that bind uh, the core modules to the native dependencies. And the core modules have loads of cool stuff, like some IO primitives, like buffers and streams, and some uh, networking stuff. Unlike certain programming languages that have FTP clients and POP clients in their standard libraries, which I think is hilarious, but Node doesn't. Node has things for TCP sockets, UDP, um, HTTP, and a few other bits. I've just truncated it a little bit for this slide. But then there's also so some support modules. So we've got uh, this util module, which you've probably used, like util inherits. I noticed in the master branch of Node that they've started to kind of deprecate a lot of this stuff. So, because I've always thought util was, whenever I see util in a programming project, I think it's probably badly named. It's just, they couldn't be bothered to think of a good name for it, so they just shoved stuff in there. So, I hope maybe we're moving away from that. I, I don't, I didn't, I just noticed it when preparing for this talk, but. In the core modules, you'll notice a huge amount of reuse. So here, we've got NetSocket. NetSocket is used to make things like the HTTP module, and it inherits from duplex streams, which inherit from readable streams, which inherit from streams. So here, here's how that works. It uses util inherits, and um, that, that's really object create, like an ECMAScript, but it, it makes it easier if you just use util inherits, I think. And it calls the constructor. So it's calling the native, the, not the native, the, um, the parent constructor. So in this case, it's duplex stream. And then it inherits from it. In libhttp.js, you will find new client request. Client requests use net create connection. Net create connection uses net socket. So we've got, this, uh, we've got this heavy amount of internal reuse, and we have a lot of inheritance going on, prototypal inheritance. Now, this example is just showing you what you can do. Most of you can probably already do this, but what you can do knowing that the networking libraries speak in streams. So here I'm making a HTTP request to the BBC News website, and I'm going to pipe that the the response from that request through a stream of my own creation and then out to a file. So this is the stream of my own creation. It replaces all instances of BBC with Big British Castle, which is obviously the correct way to read that acronym. And all, all I've done is knowing that knowing that HTTP uses streams because networks use streams. I can do all kinds of transformations on the data relatively efficiently. So if you want to get good at Node, if you don't want to make me mad, then you, you need to get in the core modules, look how they work, and learn them. They're just there. You don't need fancy books. You, <laughs> you can just read the, the source. So what about those native libraries? Well. We have uh, CARES, which I like to call CARES, because it cares about DNS. And <laughs> it uses uh, non-blocking um, TCP sockets. So what happens is it has its own socket creation function called OpenTCP socket. And this function sets the non-block flag. So that's something that the Berkeley Sockets API gives you. It, it can already do non-blocking network calls. It can say, I think it basically says to the operating system, when you're done with that TCP garbage, uh, just run this callback. 
So it fits in quite nicely with Node. There's a HTTP parser, which is like a giant 2,200 line C file. Um, and I wanted to get mad about it and say it should be refactored, but when I read it, I thought it was probably okay. And I, I, think, I think it is um, f fine the way it is. I, I could get some appreciation of what was going on. And then there's UV, which is like the crown jewel in the create collection, which um, provides an event loop and callback based notifications of IO. And it has things for working with non blocking networking, asynchronous file access, things for handling child processes. And it gives you tools that you need to wrap blocking libraries with asynchronous APIs. Then there's V8, which I didn't want to talk too much about, otherwise, we'd be here all day. And <laughs> this is a, you probably know it's a JavaScript engine. Um, it actually does provide things that the node developers need to do things like um, function templates. And I I'll look at that a little bit later. So does anybody know what company developed the risk chips used? Oh, 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 Wait a minute. It Acorn. Yeah, it was Acorn, yeah. yeah. I would have accepted ARM Holdings as well. <laughs> I've, I've already got your books there. <laughs> oh, who else? Anyone else? <laughs> Thank you for buying my book, by the way. <laughs> how, so how does a node process start up? This is quite interesting, because you can cut from C++ through JavaScript, and then into your code. There's a file cunningly called node.js, <laughs> which is invoked by C++, a C++ function. And it sets up things like the process objects, and it reads in your file with standard I.O. And it has a micro-module system for, the load, for loading the core modules. And it's really interesting, because it, if you look at what it's doing, it actually, the core modules are actually compiled into the node binary, so they can be loaded faster. So I think that's quite interesting, that they're part of Node. The standard library is kind of built into it. And this file, node.cc, compiles and executes that file. It also does something, you'll see the like, node's command line help in there and how it handles command line arguments. It also initializes V8. So if you're interested in seeing how people embed V8 into other systems, because game, game developers have started to use it and other browsers as well as Chrome use it, um, it uh, you can see how that works in there. And it has some things basically for instrumentation, so to make uh, things like signal handlers work and Windows API error handling as well. So if you go back to the core modules, you're fairly comfortable with the JavaScript in there, um, but you see this process.binding. What the hell is that? Because that, when I first saw that, I thought, that's not ECMAScript. This isn't some like standardized thing for making JavaScript interface with sockets and files and all those things. So in, if we go back to that class hierarchy, um, in net server, you'll see process binding TCP wrap. Now, that is basically a portal into the world of C or C++. There, there's a function called node set method. It used to be a macro, uh, like a C macro, but now it's a function, and it allows objects to have JavaScript method names which are bound to C++ functions. So this way you've got binding with a capital B, that's something that C++, that they've written in C, basically. Um, so it just defines methods on objects. Um, the binding function itself creates um, templates using get function. So this is stuff where V8 is starting to come in. And now I want to take you on a journey through the JavaScript all the way down to the operating system. So if we look at libfs.js, this is the FS core module that most of you probably use all the time. Um, there are bindings to various C++ functions. And let's take the example of close. So close with a capital C, it's like C sharp. Um, it's ch 
checks your arguments that you've passed it, and then it checks if a function was passed, and it, if so, it will call this async call macro. Otherwise, uh, it'll call sync call. These are macros, and these are where node, node's source code is wrapping around libuv. Async call will expand to uvfs functions. So I'll show you what that looks like. I, <laughs> can you see all the slashes at the end? That's because that's it's a, like a macro, basically, and it, it's not e necessarily easy to read. But um, where you see func, func with a ha single hash will be expanded to a string by the preprocessor, the C preprocessor. And then hash hash func will be expanded to a literal. So let's look at what happens. So we got fs rec wrap close in a string, and then we've got uvfs close. So we're setting up a request to uv to do this piece of work at some point in the future, whenever it can, and then to tell us when it's done. If we follow that down to uvfs close, we have this init macro, then we post. So it, it's kind of quite a nice metaphor, like it, it's setting up a piece of work then it's posting the piece of work to be, to be done later, and then this function will finish. So type, uh, the init macro expands to uh, where it says uvfs hash hash type. That will expand in our example to uvfs close. If we have a look at um, uv work submits, that will at some point <laughs> result in UVFS work being called. So UVFS work is like, I mean, it's a bit of a humdinger of a function because it has like a macro that calls a macro. And I've expanded it here so it makes some sense and will fit on a slide. But basically, where you see UVFS close in that switch statement, it will call the close system call, which when I first saw this, that kind of blew my mind because I thought, isn't a system called blocking? But of course, we've told UV to do a piece of work in a thread pool. So we've posted that piece of work to be done when the process can do it. And then we're doing other things while that's happening, hopefully. So if we just recap on that, it seems more complicated than it is. Um, it's in, well, more convoluted than it is, but I don't think it, I think it's quite elegant, really. Uh, libfs.js is your world of JavaScript, and you call this binding, which is a C++ function, which calls a function from UV, which sets up a piece of work to be done on the thread pool, and then eventually we call close. Oops. So what about networking? Well, like the... DNS library I mentioned earlier, TCP sockets have a non-block flag. So UV is able to say, do this piece of, uh, like this TCP request, and run this when you come back. So it works differently to the file system. So in this case, the file system can actually be blocking, but it's wrapped in thread pools. In networking, we can do non-blocking requests. But all the time, these things to us are wrapped in asynchronous APIs. And networking is, that's where I started to really get confused about what Windows was doing. So there's very platform-specific tailoring in there. I'm not a Windows expert at all. All of my examples here have been from um, the Unix source. And then we've got UVQ work, which is interesting because if you've got a blocking library, something that's inherently just designed that way, you can wrap it with UVQ work. And that is used in the case of crypto and Zlib. So certain time, certain pieces of work that Zlib are doing, it, it is going to block. So UV will execute that with uh, UVQ work. So armed with this fascinating new knowledge, you can make yourself a debug build of Node with make build type equals debug. So like if you've got your, uh, the Node source on your laptop, you can just do this. You don't need anything special. Although you need a C, comp 
C and C++ compiler. <laughs> but hopefully you've got that. And that will allow you to do things like debug it with, th this example has Apple's instruments because I work in a company, at the moment I'm working in a company that does um, Objective-C and I'm writing their node web services. So I, I just wanted to see what instruments was like because we were already using it. But actually I don't like it at all. I went, went researching this just to look how like thread pools behave when you do lots of network or uh, lots of file system requests and so on. I was using LLDB, that, that's on my Mac as well. So with LLDB you can set up symbolic breakpoints. So you could say whenever you want run UVFS read to read something from a file, break, and then you can step through and see how it works. And maybe you could use that to figure out those memory leaks as well. So Node's internals aren't that scary after all. If you want to become a better Node developer, which I'm still working on, then you want to look at the core module source code. It really teaches you a lot. Oh, here's the last question. Who is the founder of the Raspberry Pi? Who? David Braden. Yeah. Do you, do, you want to, do you want me to give it to you afterwards? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and I'll leave you with this quote by Douglas Adams. We're stuck with technology when what we really want is just stuff that works.